Oh, Microfoil's gonna be forced to flash out as Easy Life teleports in to join the fight. Mega Upla is gonna try and land that stun onto Argentine Import, but a nice job from the NAR to kite out the Renekton. The Dominus has been popped, but the third auto will finish him off. But potentially taking down Microfoil is still alive somehow, and they end up trading two for two so far. Argentine Import is here. The Elder Dragon buff has despawned a three man NAR into the inhibitor of all places. Will be in that the signal for Tusk to go in. Safely, KC Mango gonna try to flash out the Guardian Shield is a lot. There comes the bullet time, gonna take down John Su. Constantine Valdor is here already, but the Chrono oh, breaks back. Oh, we'll pick up two kills, bro. Uh, there's a little bit of fight breaking out. Yeah. So does Hart. The two carries for Maris are down. Can he get into the pit? He's going to get in there. There comes the hero's entrance. He steals the dragon for the second time in a row. Are you kidding me, Morn? Two steals in a row. Three man taunt. Killer instinct in. Mango is down. Argentine with the teleport. Another kill onto the goblin. Foil is under attack. There comes the blob. No defense available for NYU. They to lock down the castle and having that easy life to target he like will pick him up bear dog trying to get one back onto the 80 carry but no a double kill going over to john Su, and that can be called the forge god Stiffius is looking for john Su, and he finds him that's going to be the flash key to try and get that brittle proc in and john Su is running for his life looks like this might have gone a little bit too far though the roof's going to finish him off and that's going to be a shutdown from argentine import curtain call has opened up this could be the turnaround that tusk needs a huge petrifying gaze coming out of tuesday this could be big for lehigh stopwatch already used on the constant that's going to be dead argentine Morn is going to come in and finish a kill off onto the Cassiopeia. And it's going to be a 2v3 right now. A crit finishes off. This is Lehigh. The bug has been squashed finally. And one more will do it. Speaking of greed, that's going to be Masuta being caught up for the second time in a row. Constantine going to land that Zenith Blade onto him. He's picking at below 100 HP. But it looks like Kokoro is going to try and save him for now. That's going to be a kill. Uh, Johnson's going to pick that up, but there's the re-engage. Police Survivors and Kokoro are trying to go for this. Flash Q from Constantine's going to lock up the Oriana and she's going to fall. Police Survivors is now strangely out of position. Level 6 is going to be the Solar Flare. Coming out of Constantine, that's going to be a double kill for Argentine Import. The spawn, Ufo's going to dash up the wall, have the Dominus available, and it looks like he's going to get chunked out pretty low. They're going to knock up Argentine Import. The South American might be in a bit of trouble. There comes the hero's entrance. Going to knock up a lot of members here onto NYU. Microfoil goes down. So does Mango. And Thompson's winning this fight hard. Sable is going to get taunted up and shut down. And so is Oofla. Goblin's the only one left. But the Meganar has already been unleashed. The wallop is there. The autos are there. The BM is there. Shutdown is there. That's going to be Argentine in for getting the ace. He picked up. But that's going to be a two-man solar flare from Constantine. Curtain call has been issued. And Morn is in the front line looking for some damage. Curtain call will only land onto Zipius. Hiving the tower for dead already because Tuesday was not even there. He's gonna try in 1v5, but that's gonna be a tough task for Yasuo. And Ace picked up for Tusk, their second in the game, and a huge team fight win for the Jumbos as they look for the inhibitor. Hello everybody, welcome to the JumboCast Twitch channel. We got some CSL playoffs action coming at you once again. I'm Andrew Howe, joined by my good friend Ben Hawkins. Hawk, how are you doing today? I am doing great. First time on the CSL casting desk and Grapes, thank you so much for having me on this one. It is going to be a great matchup here today. Yeah, I mean, I'm super excited for this. We're back in the loser's bracket after an insane series, to say the least. Yesterday, the Jumbos ended up taking down Penn State and moving on into this next round of the loser's bracket in a 2-1 fashion, where they will today face up against Virginia Commonwealth University Black. And, Hawk, there's just so many interesting things to talk about about that last series. But, I mean, it, overall, it was just a, a, a really impressive showing from Tufts, and, and they really just... Um, pulled through at the end yeah it was i mean a slugfest of a series quite frankly but they did manage to get it done at the end of the day and hey that's all that matters is that you moved on and here we are in this round tufts against vcu a t titan of a matchup uh coming up for this one and you know i i mean the Tufts managed to slug it out against Penn State and move on. So I'm confident that they might have what it takes to do it again. But VCU, I mean, they are no slouch of a team. They've got, uh, you know, Youngest Lay and uh, playing Jungle, actually. Challenger last season, very highly ranked. Um, you know, will be up against Warren. And looking at that matchup, I think already that is the most interesting matchup we have so far today.
yeah, I mean, we got a challenge. We got a, a former challenger jungler on the side of VCU. We got a current proving grounds member in the jungle in Morn. There's so much um, volatility. I think that can really happen in this matchup, especially considering the kind of pools that they have. You know, they really value a lot of these heavy early game champions like the Elise, like the Olaf, even. And so. It's, it's really going to be interesting to see how they, they manage to turn this out. But taking a look at the starting rosters real quick, this is a little bit up in the air as we do have a couple of uh, roster decisions that we're finalizing right now in terms of subs. But for VCU, it's going to be Miss McLeachie in the top lane, youngestly in the jungle, Thick Chick 42 in the mid lane, and Ticha and Artemis will be the bot lane for them. And currently, right now, for the Jumbos, we got Justinian in the top lane, Morn into the jungle, as we said before. Easy Life in the mid lane. Belisarius in the bot lane alongside Ezra Allen. So, right now, Jansu um, may or may not be in this game, and we might receive word about that in just of a second. But, Hawk, uh, if we don't want to talk about the, the bot lane right now, because we don't really know what's going on, but the top lane matchup is something, something, something we got to look at. Yeah, a very interesting matchup on the top side here. I mean, McLeachie and Justinia, two very capable players uh, up there. And, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting top lane matchups right now. Not a whole lot of safe blind picks. Outside of Gragas, you're basically looking at needing a counter pick of some sort. So definitely could be very dangerous up there, especially with uh, what appears to have been a roll swap from VCU. Um, will be interesting to see if McLeachie is able to hold on up there against a very capable top laner who was challenger last year in Latin America. Yeah, it's it's interesting that that the the roll swaps really happen the way it is. I mean, we were uh, before um this game actually began before we went live. We were we were kind of talking about a narrative of you know challenger versus challenger in the top side because we thought that youngest Lee would be headed into the top lane to match up against Justinian, but instead they're gonna stick their best player in his best role, try to just have Miglichi survive. But especially now, Hawk, as you said, with Tufts on the red side, gonna allow for that counter pick to come out, and with a lot of the volatile champions that Justinian really likes to play, things like the Nar, things like the Camille definitely could be valuable yeah absolutely and it is worth it that you mention these ju th these junglers because both both of them with you know the volatility volatile styles they like to play i mean youngest lee and morn share so much of their champion pool as you already highlighted they both are the kind of players that if they get ahead in the early game they can absolutely take over so i am very excited to see if they're you know able to keep up with each other because of course youngest lay does have a rank advantage but we have seen more and time and time again take over games if he's allowed to but if he gets over aggressive can get punished very heavily so i think definitely all eyes top jungle 2v2 for this first game to see how it crumbles yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of this attention, as you said, though, would be fo will be focused towards this top side. Taking a look at the bot lanes, I feel like just in general of their pools and things like that, just going to be pretty general in terms of um, of just being pretty even and stuff. I think Big Chick and Easy Life in the mid lane especially, not going to be super volatile. I think they both like enjoy playing for scaling, playing for some of these later game fights, unless you get... Uh, Thick Chick gets his hands on something like a Fizz or an Echo. So we'll see what happens in the draft as it is getting underway. Quick word as we the draft has begun. It's going to be Ezra Allen in the support role and Belisarius actually going over to AD Carry. So these things might swap in between the games, but with this substitution going on in game one, it's going to be pretty interesting because we've seen Belisarius um, playing that support role for the majority of the time here in CSL. Yeah, we have seen uh, Belisarius on support like you said pretty much the entire time so it will be interesting to see if he's able to get it done on ad carry with ezra allen uh the substitute backing him up but as we get underway in picks mids we already see we talked about this volatile jungle matchup the respect ban towards morn's elite coming out first from bcu they do not want to let morn get on that high pressure early game jungler and start taking over the game so we already are seeing this sort of uh, attention going towards that side and then bot lane being focused down now by the rest of the teams uh seraphine tristana from tough's first two bands santa kaisa the uh last two bands from vcu not letting comfort go over to the bot lanes Belisarius, most played champion is senna one of the best on the server to say the least but all the bands on the tough's red side means that a certain Zoe is left on the table for that first pick and that is something that Thick Chick definitely likes to play. Wouldn't be surprised to see an Annie in response here. Definitely a champion that goes well into the Zoe. You know, you can stun right on top of that portal jump when she comes back. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. I know Easy Life really has had a lot of success on that Annie recently, but we'll see what happens here in this next rotation. 
Yeah, first pick Zoe is really interesting to me. Of course, it's a massive comfort pick for Thick Chick there in the mid lane. Uh, really, really enjoys that pick. And VCU generally likes playing the sort of uh, low interaction, pokey kind of style. Uh, you know, Zoe heavily played in the mid lane. Uh, we've seen a lot of Jin and then Enchanter supports in the bot lane. So lots of range coming through from them. But Zoe, I feel like definitely tips your hand in draft a little early almost because Zoe only works on specific kinds of compositions. You need something a little bit lower tempo to make her work. So Tuff's immediate response, picking a lot of tempo. Olaf insta locked for more with the Zaya coming through for Velisaria, something very safe, something very long range. And then the Olaf can absolutely take over the game with his fast clear speed. Um, so really like that pick, but that does open up. I was just about to say the Rel coming through for BCU, not something we're particularly used to seeing for Artemis there in support, but it is basically the strongest support in the current meta. Um, don't think there's really any question about that. And I would expect to see a uh, jungle counter pick come through here before more can get pinched away from Tufts in the second round of bans. Yeah, currently I think uh, when you think of Artemis, you normally think of things like um, like Seraphine, like the Janna, a lot of these more Enchanter-esque types of supports, but definitely the Rel, as you said, is a very strong uh, bot laner and, and it's matched up with the Jin coming out from Anticha, one of his most played champions, definitely a personal favorite of his. And so that's going to round out the bottom side of the map for VCU in the first rotation. Tufts might have the option to counter pick support here or they could potentially go for a mid lane pick as well. Yeah, Alistar is up. That's what I would expect to see as the initial response, uh, depending on Elsewhere Alice champion pool, but it is that Annie that you talked about. So it will be uh, not a mirror draft. VCU not having their jungler and Tufts not having the support locked in. I'd expect to see uh, that Alistar get banned out in the second round by VCU. And likewise, jungle pinch likely here from Tufts. And I may be banning out uh, safe blind pick top laners, such as the Gragas, but I'm not sure if that is in McLeachie's wheelhouse. Um, it is interesting because I, I, I also wonder if this Rel was a denial from Ezra Allen. Um, it, it, like I said, it is the strongest support right now, and the strongest option into poke is almost always going to be hard engage, and Rel absolutely brings that. She's the best engage support in the current meta, easily gets on top of the Jin Zoe, so you'd steal that one away. Don't let that fall into Tufts' hands, force them down the tier list just a little bit onto something that might be a little bit harder to pull off, a little bit harder to find those fights. Well, you were talking about Engage Huck, and that's the Rakan being taken away from VCU. They recognize that this is something that could lead to their downfall, this hard Engage style. Meanwhile, Tufts definitely keeping uh, Youngest Lee in their thoughts here as they ban away two junglers, the Lilia and the Udyr. Two S-tier champions, I would say, in that jungle role will not be available in this final stage of the draft. Camille going to be taken away from Justinian as well. He's going to round out the five band. Yeah, that Camille ban signals to me that VCU wants to blind Gnar on their last rotation here to try to get a decent matchup because Camille is the favorite counter pick into Gnar uh, pretty much always. So it sort of forced Tufts into a decision. Do you try to deny the Gnar, get a good top lane now, or do you go on to the Alistar to counter the Rel? It will actually be a Leona coming through for Ezra Allen. Not exactly what I would have gone. I think there are better options available, but regardless, it is that hard engagement that we were talking about. Yeah, that hard engage definitely comes out here with Leona. I'm not entirely sure about Ezra Allen's champion pool in the support role. I know typically he's more of a bot laner here, but it's going to be the Graves pick up here for Youngest Slay. Definitely a super vol uh, volatile pick, somebody who can scale up really well. Haven't really seen too much of it in the meta recently, but seeing that Graves lock in, definitely going to be exciting. Going to provide a whole bunch of damage as we get towards that late game. And we were talking about, uh, you know, playing safe in this top lane for Michalici. It's going to be that Cho'Gath lock in. Yeah, Cho'Gath's really interesting. It does provide a much needed frontline for VCU as it's hard to rely on exclusively your support to be a frontline. I still would have rather seen a NAR pick. I think it works better with what VCU's composition is trying to do, which is heavy skirmishing, trying to find isolated members, create picks, and generate siege pressure. And I think NAR is extremely good at that. And it will be NAR countered by Tufts R5 into the Cho'Gath matchup. It is pretty much a free matchup. You get the percent max health damage from the Hyper. You have the range versus melee matchup. It should be pretty easy and also not at too much risk of a gank due to the Graves pick for Youngest Lee, which I do like the pick. I think VCU's uh, mid jungle bot side has a very clear and defined win condition. They want to try to just pressure you out from maximum range and not let Tufts get close. But I've got to be honest, it, it goes back to that Zoe first pick that we saw where you pick it so early, it almost locks you into your composition before the draft has 
even started. And it is an expected sort of long range composition from BC Wars. So Tufts were able to immediately identify that after the first pick and try to pivot into that. Olaf does extremely well into this kind of composition. Leona, long range engage, and the ability to one shot anybody on a moment's notice. Nar flying over the top with the follow up engage. So there's a lot of options for Tufts, I feel like, to counter and get on top of this VCU comp. Yeah, I mean, the only champion that thematically you could argue doesn't really fit with the Jumbo Super Wall is that Zaya, somebody who likes kind of people that play into her. But I, I think that it's not really going to matter because at this point, it's, it's all about just like having a source of, of heavy AD damage. I think that Zaya really provides a lot of heavy DPS as we get towards that late game. And that's just, it's just going to be up to uh, this top side. It's going to be up to, it's going to be up to um, Justinian. It's going to be up to Morn to really get in. Uh, with those engaged tools and with some help from Alan as well, just you know, diving into the co uh, poke composition at the right moments because um, if if they if VCU does end up ever getting flanked, they're going to be in for a whole lot of trouble. Yeah, very very interesting. As that is a Rakan being locked in. Yep, that is going to be the draft dodged away from for a second right there. Um, but yeah, as as we uh, you mentioned, I think the only thing that could have necessarily been better than the Zaya pick would have been a Sivir for Tufts. Uh, Sivir Olaf is absolutely horrifying. Sivir also does relatively well in the poke because if you miss position, you can block that summoner spell um, and not get caught up by it, or not summoner spell, excuse me, the CC ability or uh, what have you. So. Um, yeah, but the Zaya definitely provides a lot of safety, I think, and good long-range damage, and like you said, that consistent source of damage, and I think it just does make sense into the composi uh, composition. You can dodge out of Zoe Bubbles, dodge out of the Rel Engage, I think most importantly, so there, it does provide a lot of utility for this team. Yeah, I, I guess I, I do agree with you there. You know, the synergy, I, this, the sources of kind of engage that VCU has, all can be countered by that uh, Feather Storm. You got things like uh, the Sleepy Trouble Bubble or the Rupture coming out from Cho'Gath. All these things are pretty easily dodgeable um, from that Zaya if, if, you know, it really prevents the, the sort of picks that could come out, especially if a Gale Force or something like that is also bought into the inventory there for Belisarius. And it's going to be interesting to see Belisarius, you know, uh, coming in last year in the CSL, he was the starting AD carry. And, and with the introduction of Jansu onto the team, uh, you know, taking one for the team, moving down to that support role, playing a different role for the team, kind of, as he heads later into his uh, college career, I guess you could say. But yeah, Belisari seeing him now back on his ADC, uh, something that, you know, he plays a lot in solo queue more often than that support role. It's going to be interesting to see how, um, how it works out in this team environment. Yeah, and I think it's going to be really worth watching this bot lane this game, because both Jin Rel for VCU and Zaya Leona for Tufts are such strong 2v2 lanes. They both have immense kill threat. If Rel ever able to find somebody, Jin follows it up with the root, and Zaya, if she doesn't have that ultimate available, probably will get taken down. But there is such a strong initiation as well on the side of Tufts. If Zaya is able to survive that initial burst, stack up the feathers, that Rel doesn't really have a way out. You root her up, you get the chain CC followed up with the shield of daybreak from the Leona. There is a lot of turn potential from Tufts, and I it, it, both these bot lanes, as I said, super super strong so it will come down to execution but anticha and artemis they are you know playing their main roles whereas tufts has been role swapping around just a little bit belisari's uh you know as you said main support as we're allen coming in as the substitute so it will be interesting to see if they're able to survive in this difficult lane if they are i like what tufts composition is able to do but if vcu's comp is able to get rolling on that bottom side of the map i think it'll be very very hard for them to find their way back into this one yeah, and you almost wonder uh, if any jungle attention really will go down there from VCU. Uh, I think Youngest Lee uh, kind of isn't really super concerned with, you know, having this Cho'Gath really get ahead of Anar. So it's yeah. kind of a matchup. You kind of, you pick to just, you know, leave him on an island a little bit. Miklichi, um not probably going to be, you know, solo killing um, Justinian anytime soon in that laning phase, regardless of if he gets any ganks or not. So I, I, I do think that... Um, Youngest Lee, the highest ranked member here for VCU, will probably focus a lot of his attention towards bot. And we're talking about volatility, definitely could turn that matchup into the favor once you start getting some more um, attention by your jungler. Yeah, absolutely. And he wants to be playing bot side not only because of, you know, it's a Cho'Gath in the top side and it, it should be a weak side pick, but Zoe is going to push in the Annie. Annie has kill threat, but Zoe just has the range. She has the consistent wave clear with her Q to be able to keep that wave shoved up. So if 
the bot lane of VCU is also able to win their lane and secure a shove. That opens up Youngest Lake to start looking for early dragons, start looking for early invades onto Morn, pressuring it off of camps, taking those grubs, taking those blue buffs, trying to put the Olaf a little bit further behind and get his bottom side of the map ahead because not only... Does he want to get his bot lane and mid lane ahead? He wants to get himself ahead. Graves, very selfish champion, can take a lot of this farm. Any jungle camp stolen away in the Graves-Olaf matchup is absolutely huge. Both of these champions, very high economy. So it will be interesting to see if they're able to generate that pressure on that side of the map. See Youngest Lee walk in and start getting that pressure. Um... Because early dragons in this game could be a huge win condition. You've got the Cho'Gath to uh, use the Devour on the dragon. Uh, secure those. I feel like it'll be very hard to fight back from a dragon's deficit for Tufts. Because VC's composition is very good at fighting around these early to mid-game objectives. Yeah, and I think they, they, they scale better as well. I mean, you have something like Olaf, uh, champion that doesn't really scale well. Obviously, with the introduction of things like that Gore Drinker Sterex build, does kind of end up being a little bit more sustainable as you get towards that late game. But once you get once you get a Graves to, you know, even three items, it's, it's just going to be super, uh, way, way stronger of a champion, um, uh, especially in these uh, kind of scenarios around dragons and barons and different objectives. And Cho'Gath, infinitely scaling champion there with the stacks as well. And, and and just Jin as well, uh, another champion that scales really well with items. I think Tuss is the onus is on them to kind of have more and play through this top side, get uh, Justinian super far ahead, allow Easy Life to you know get some kills onto the Zoe as well, um, and and really it's up to them to try to get through this early game. Yeah, absolutely. Both these compositions, I feel like, have clearly defined win conditions, and it truly will come down to execution. No major flaws in either draft. Tufts looking to one-shot a VCU, looking to control the map. And I think that is what we have to look forward to in this game. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back onto the Rift. We got game one between VCU and Tufts right after this.
welcome back to Summoner's Rift, everybody. We're here with game one of the CSL playoffs. You got VCU on your blue side, Tufts University on your red side. Hawk, this is going to be a super exciting series. Both of these teams really hungry for a win. It's win or go home here in this best of three. And both of these teams don't want to go home just yet. Definitely not wanting to go home. And both these teams hungry for blood as we see the standard five points start coming through. It's VCU on the blue side of the rift with Tufts on the red side game number one of the csl playoff yeah you know tufts university blue is the team name but you know you got to be <laughs> red side half the time it's not always going to be that color coding matchup here you know yesterday we had penn state against tufts two teams that were both blue so <laughs> a little <laughs> bit hard for them but you know now taking a look at this early level one it's going to be a standard five point for most uh looks like anti shot took a little bit of a recall after placing a ward getting that sweeper before that 130 mark as a jungle camp spot yeah interesting ward plays actually i guess you know trying to defend for the potential of an invade or a tri brush cheese wouldn't really consider leona annie zaya to be the best invade composition especially up against the likes of rel but still set in place that ward getting the recall off um and so and you know don't typically see uh the sweeper coming out on the ad carry so yeah very interesting decision as we do see just both junglers starting on their respective blue buffs youngest lee already deciding that he wants to play around the bot side he's foregoing a little bit of clear speed right there in favor of getting the early advantage on that side and with more passing to the top side it should be free reign as we actually see him passing towards Morn's red predicting the olaf to go for a full clear and Morn has no idea yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't look like he's really aware of this. There's no vision available. He's going to actually use that E to get over the Baron pit into the enemy red. So Morn is padding towards his wolves right now. He has no idea that he's about to get three buffs. And really smart play coming out from Youngest Lee. I, I mean, they had the vision coming through that bot side that was placed there by anti Chat at the beginning of the game. So they kind of um, have a general idea of, of where Morn is, especially considering the, the leash timings and things like that. And so, yeah, Morn's going to run right over and, and have everything stolen from him, it seems. Yeah, that's a really nice play by Youngest Lee. Incredibly intelligent pathing, just because most any typical Olaf player will want to start with the double leash on his blue buff. It is the fastest possible clear that Olaf has available to him against that blue buff. So you can just spam the axes and clear very, very quickly. So knowing that standard pathing timers, he just understands that Olaf is going to want to full clear and won't be there for the second buff. So he walks in, takes that one away, gets it for practically free, and then also with the leash on the bottom side of stick, Chick actually going on an easy life. Oh, it's first blood coming out with the ignite. That spell thief, uh, little blades coming in, super helpful in that early game. And easy life getting the counter, but you know, dying in that solo lane, getting first blooded. Yeah, easy life doesn't have the damage to one shot that Zoe just yet, and. With Thick Chick having the Ignite instead of the Teleport, Easy Life just not respecting the damage from this. So he gets caught up, gets taken down. That is a huge solo kill in the mid lane. So top side of the map already not going well. And the point I was going to make before is also with the bot lane leashing for Tufts, it meant that BCU was able to take control of the wave first. So now they have winning bot lane, winning mid lane. They take away the red buff on the top side. So now Morn has really nothing to do on the map, putting the jungler behind. So the early game, Going exceptionally well for VCU, putting them 500 gold in the lead, which while not very significant, the advantages they have, the wave pressure that they have, can open up for more advantages down the stretch. Yeah, and especially considering that this jumbo team composition is one that really needs to have this scaling into the later game, we might actually see them get um, a bit of this early Whoa. advantage back, though, because Morn has come over to the top side with the wave pushing against McLeachy. The Undertoes will land, the Flash will fail oh. over the wall. That's a tough one, but you always hate to see it anyway, though. Actually, the next axe is going to miss, and here comes Thick Chick. Morn's going to have to be careful, though, because Justinian can't really, you know, come in with that wave shoved in under his tower. Morn's now stuck in a 2v1. The Rupture's going to come through. McLeachy is so low. The Boomerang will finally take him out, and Morn's going to come on and survive with that Triumph proc onto him. Nice rune placement there. Easy Life's going to come in, make sure that Thick Chick can't finish off the kill. Uh, it was a little bit dicey at times, but Morn's going to end up getting that kill. Yeah, Morn. Finally picks it up, McLeachy with, uh, it feels bad man, flash, it happens to the best of us, even diamond players fail flashes <laughs> over walls occasionally, but man, that was very greedy pathing by Thick Chick, if there was a ward on that red side, I, I would think Tufts would have been able to turn onto him as well and take him down, but able to path around it, not quite able to take down the kill on more, path back to the mid lane, and 
it does open up the easy life to shove out that wave and get a favorable back timer off for himself. So still nice advantage on the solo lanes and uh, Morn getting that kill back for himself means that Tufts still very much in this one, uh, you know, despite the good first couple minutes there from BCU. And as the lanes just going back to an even state farming across the board, we do see farm advantages in both of the solo lanes, however minor in uh, the mid lane. And with this fat wave pushing in, towards Belisarius, this should be about an even CS lead in the bot lane. Yeah, the play was made towards that top side by Morn. Brilliant job getting that kill, evening out the kill score a little bit, focusing towards that top side. But, as we said that, you know, Youngest Lee was making his way back into Morn's jungle, taking those second respawns of the Wolves. And so, uh, it's been five and a half minutes, and Youngest Lee has that uh, CS advantage and hasn't even touched his bot side clear. The red buff has not been taken yet, still out on level one. It just shows how much counter jungling Youngest Lee really has been doing. Hasn't even been focusing along his own bottom side quadrant of the map. And so Belisarius actually might be caught out a little bit. Can I do a nice dodge away from the Deadly Flourish? But now with the Dragon spawn, both of these junglers headed towards bot. Yeah, just really nice pathing across the board from Youngest Lee so far this game. And we saw too, Thick Check walking down to the bottom side, getting the vision down. That is now spotting out Morn as he blast cones over. They get it about a minute in advance of Youngest Lee coming down. That means there will be no vision by the time the Graves finishes its full clear down there. It takes about a full minute to clear both sides of your jungle, uh, or a full minute for each side, I should say, as Morn definitely going to go down here in the river. Yeah, I mean, didn't have the push in the mid lane. Kind of got caught in a 1v2 with the bot lane roaming up as well. Thick Chick actually continuing to jump forward with the portal jump. Sleepy Trouble level off of cooldown in just a couple of seconds. They're going to land a Deadly Flourish on the Easy Life. Going to force that flash. Crucial cooldown issued uh, off of that Tufts mid laner. And it looks like because of that, it's going to be a quick, easy first dragon potentially for VCU. Yeah, no, Bella, sorry. Oh. You need to be careful clearing this ward. You don't have pressure down here. They're going to land the knock up there with the W and Belisarius will go down. Artemis will pick him up. Greek versus Rome there and it looks like Artemis will take the dub in that department. 3-1 going over to VCU to start this game off. Yeah, Belisari is greedy, greedy trying to clear that ward. Your jungler was just killed. Easy Life was just collapsed on you. Know that VCU has control over the bottom side. River, you cannot step up to that one as Morn is able to secure the blue buff, but Uncle Slee is level 6. Allen coming in as well, gonna land that Q, as it's gonna be a 2v2 here, the only difference, Youngest Lee does have that collateral damage, already had it used though, and that's gonna be Allen picking up the kill, here comes Belisarius as well, coming straight from the base, but Antichas here, that's a double root, the Zenith Blade coming in from Allen as well, they're gonna stun him up, the Flash will kind of try to get Anticha away, uses the force shot, now has to re, um, re, uh, reload right there, but it's a double kill coming through from Belisarius, Big Chick is now the one on the run, Tufts going through oh, with nice. three consecutive Zenith kills, Blade. and the Zenith Blade from Max will yield a triple kill from Belisarius and Justinian gonna get that solo on the top side as well. A delayed ace coming out from the Jumbos after a quick um, misplay there in the early game. They're coming right back. Yeah, Belisarius after overextending says, all right guys, that's my bad. Uh, it was actually just a calculated back. Comes out of Fountain and gets three quick kills right back for himself and that will be the dragon going the way of Tufts as well. VCU make an overextension of their own. It was initially a great setup by them. I was talking about how they set up the vision. Trade kill on the top side. They're still fighting. There's fight top and bot. McLeachy ended up coming back with the teleport and taking down Justinian with the feast. A little bit of an overextension there from the Tufts top laner as well. The dragon was secured by Morn down on that bottom side. Youngest Lee did go in with um, uh, the, the, the t attempt to try and steal that Drake away. Ended up having to blow the flash as well as Alan went for that re-engage um, into the pit as, um, in addition to that. So overall, uh, after this stage in the game, headed into the nine minute mark, the gold is even, but I think the tempo advantage is right now towards the Jumbos, just in terms of their recent plays that they've made. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, good setup initially from VCU. They set up the vision in advance of their jungler coming down, they get the pick, but then they go too deep and in the enemy jungle, they don't respect the resets coming through and get themselves taken down. The dragon goes over. And then on the reset, not quite able to clean up any of those kills. Justinian, McLeachy trading one for one on the top side. Uh, Justinian trying to not let that wave get frozen on him uh, and trying to push that in. But you've got the teleport available. Just take the recall. You don't need to die for the wave. But regardless, it is a one for one. And it is four to six, and as you mentioned, the gold under a thousand, but I would say tempo was slightly in favor of the Jumbos at the moment, but with mid pressure still going the way of Thick Chick, the wave clear just too strong from the Zoe. It does open up Youngest Lee to try to look for some of these early plays, uh, you know, around 
to the map, let his mid laner roam, try to look for something like this Rift Herald, but with both junglers on the top side, Balin going to walk in, clear out some vision. We do have a dance. 3v2, Justinian, towards the flash. Yeah, it was on the wrong side of the wall there. It didn't end up using that Nar in, um, in on to make Lichi. But with that summoner spell down, it's going to be VCU actually starting up the Rift Herald. Doesn't look like Morn will be really be have any chance of getting into the pit uh, safely here. But looks like he might just try to run around the long way and is going to try to actually peel the youngest Lee off of the objective. There's going to be a Tibbers burn in the mid lane. A stick chick and a land of trouble bubble as well. The Ignite's taken for easy life pretty low here. The flash but with the portal jump will take him down. And Morn goes down as well in the jungle of VCU. Don't know what he was really doing there. But that's two straight kills going over to VCU in the top side. Yeah, Morn overextending massively in the jungle. Not sure what the plan was on that one. And Thick Chick just playing this 1v1 so nicely. He's like trying to block the Paddle Stars with the bear, but Thick Chick manages to sneak it around and get this solo kill for himself. That is the second of this game, and you know that is concerning. When you opted into this matchup, this was the counter pick to the Zoe. It is considered a counter matchup, so to fall behind like this in game number one, definitely not ideal. But regardless, Tusk. Still marginally holding onto the gold lead, just trying to fend off the Rams as Harold going to go the way of Youngest Lee. Probably will shore up that gold lead in due time. No plates actually haven't been taken except for one on the top side from Justinian. And this is a half health Minionar with no flash. You have got to be careful. But Olaf yeah. is here. And Ezra Allen roaming up from the top side off of his reset. Youngest Lee could be caught out. They're going to have to try and stall as long as they can. Justinian just finally getting out of that tired form, but the wall of is there, and Morn is going to actually take down the kill. Beautiful hyper procs coming out from Justinian to make sure that he, uh, you know, gets enough damage down onto Youngest Lee. Meanwhile, Easy Life might have caught out the VCU support as well. Artemis not really going to be able to fight back here, and beautiful punish coming out from Tufts. They saw that Youngest Lee was going to try and come in onto that top lane turret with the Rift Herald once McLeishi pushed the wave in. They made sure that none of that happened at any time. Yeah, really nice punish there from the Jumbos. Youngest Lee thinking he had the pressure on that side of the map. After taking down the Herald, he knew that his mid laner had just gotten the solo kill, but he didn't have the vision set up, so he didn't actually know where Morn was. Justinian baits it beautifully, able to take down that kill, donate it over to his Olaf. So it delays the Herald push from this Graze. It punishes the counter jungle, and Youngest Lee actually falling behind a little bit after a fantastic early game. A lot of the gold for the Rams right now sitting on uh, the Zoe, and while that is definitely where you want some of it, uh, Zoe, not really the kind of champion that can solo carry a game. Of course, if she's able to find a good bubble, can be very, very deadly, but can struggle in some of these mid-game team fights. And I mentioned that is sort of what VCU's composition wants to try to do. Um, so, you know, without Graves really being ahead at all, with this Olaf being pretty strong, and not to mention the 3 and one Zaya makes a prospect of some of these teamfights carry, with Dragon spawning in just under 10 seconds. Vision set up, going the way of Tusk. However, Rift Herald being summoned in the mid lane to try to generate some pressure back for the Rams. Yeah, and Youngest Lee is caught here in this top side with the Dragon spawning in just a couple of seconds. Justinian, though, gotta be careful. Very, very squishy so far early on. And Ticha gonna miss that Solar Flare away from him. Looks like the sleep will end on Morn as well. Tibbers over the wall coming through from Easy Life, though. Gotta be careful. The curtain call will open up. Magnus Storm will land onto two. That's gonna be a lot of health bars going down for the Jumbos. It's gonna be a one for two so far. Justinian is trying to build up the Mega Nar, but he's not gonna be able to do it. A double kill coming through from Anticha. Belisarius and Easy Life are the ones surviving. It's a 2v4 around the Dragon Pick, and Thick Chick's gonna look for the AD carry. And with the Feast, with the Smite already used, it's going to be a little bit harder for the Dragon to go down. But Easy Life still has to be careful, going to get hit by the Sleep. You can't dodge that, and that's going to be Mick Leechy picking up the kill of his fourth of the game. And that is Velsarius going down as well. A delayed Ace, that's going to be Dragon picked up, tying the score at 1-1. One to -one. Man, that's like the third delayed Ace of the game or something along those lines. BCU, they managed to find themselves a fight. I feel like... The Jumbo is just mispositioning on that fight a little bit. You didn't really need to fight over that wall with the short range composition that they have. No flash on Warren means that he can't really get into that one, just gets taken down. And that is the distance that VCU's, VCU's composition wants. They want to be fighting you over the walls. They want to be fighting you from long range. They manage to find a good one. They get the kills, they get the dragon. They find themselves with a 2000 gold lead, the first significant one of the game. And that is absolutely huge. And Ticha, the benefactor of so many of those kills, getting a shutdown on the Belisarius off the back of it. That is absolutely tremendous. We see you 
right into the driver's seat of this one. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that this is, has been a relatively sloppy game coming out from both of these sides. But uh, it's right now, VCU having the advantages here, you know, playing the team comps the way that they want to, and it's yielding them about a 2k gold lead, and McLeachy might be in a bit of trouble. Stuck in a 1v3, that's going to be uh, the Solar Flare issued as well. McLeachy just used the Feast, going to have the Gnar into the wall to stun him up just one more time. The Cooler will finish off the kill shutdown going over on to Justinian. Yeah, big shutdown, that's allowing them to buy space. Youngest League getting stunned up! Oh, that's the Timbers, the stun, everything is there. The blue buff will be secured by Morn as well. The extra punch in the face on the, the invade. Youngest League getting caught out. He knew that a lot of members were towards that top side and gets punished for it. Yeah, really nice moves there from Tufts. They understand that coming off the reset, there's actually not too much to be fighting for. So VCU just trying to sort of reset their waves there and Tufts getting out on the map just a little bit sooner. Belisari is gonna TP down uh, or get TP'd upon. Excuse me, to prevent this dive. Yeah, but Justinian has joined the fray. Gonna be a trade of teleports by the top laners to save Belisarius' life under the tier one. And so right now, I don't think uh, a fight's really gonna erupt here in just yet, but Tufts is gonna send their resources down. You know, you see Morn and Ezra Allen working towards that bottom side, and with the Neganar building up, doesn't look like VCU really wants to contest this. They're gonna back off. Yeah, definitely not wanting to overextend themselves in that dive. The wave was not there, and with the Nar joining the fray, they don't want to overextend. But McLeachy going for the kill! Look at the damage coming out from McLeachy so much. That's going to be a Featherstorm burn. Trade for Flash is honestly not that bad if you're a Zaya, but you got to be careful. I mean, this Cho got the building full tank and can still 1v1 you essentially for free. Yeah, I, I don't know if McLeachy thought that either Belisarius didn't have ultimate or if he just had more damage, but that was not what you want. Cho'Gath Flash can be very big. That Flash Devoured not going to be available for any future fights, uh, at least for the next five minutes. So pretty big cooldown wasted, I would say, right there for no benefit at all. So definitely, uh, as you said, I don't think it's been a little bit of a sloppy game for both sides. We have 21 kills in 17 minutes. So probably <laughs> make it 22 graves as... Never mind, and TJ actually gonna chase him off. Justinian needs to be careful, taking so much damage from that chin, but just let's take stock for a moment as we do have a break yeah. in the action. We have 7,000 gold over that on Antija. He is by far the most rich person in this game. A 500 ahead of his opposite number and almost 1,000 ahead of anybody else in this game. He is the man to watch. This chin is certainly online, getting towards that collector very quickly as we see more fighting. More. Might get caught out here, doesn't use the Ragnarok even. It's gonna be Youngest Lee picking up that kill, and now Allen's on the run. Caught in a 1v3, Justinian doesn't have the Narbar uh, balanced up, which means that Antigia will pick up his fourth kill of the game. Big Chick is gonna continue to go in onto Justinian as well, gonna miss Trouble Bubble, but it doesn't look like the Nar will go down just yet, but the shot number one coming out from Antigia will secure his double kill, will secure another kill going over to VCU, and will secure the second Rift Herald as well. Yeah, they will be able to take that one over. If you see you finding more for themselves, sending their gold lead just a bit. Two and a half thousand in the lead right now. Almost three thousand, actually, as the Retail will be going over to Youngest Lead. They could probably break the top lane turret with it should he want to, or take the Empower Recall, save it for later. It looks like he will actually just decide to clear a control word here on this side. But regardless, I, I, I just feel like the Jumbos right now not really respecting their wave states and understanding where and when they want to fight. I think they understand that they want to fight, but they are not really planning ahead on it. And they've gotten punished very well from VCU, who despite, I think, making some overextensions of their own, they've just generally understood how to fight these team fights better. They, they know that their composition wants to work at range. They want to work together to try to take down individual targets. It's it's like, you know, if you're fighting, uh, I, I can't think of a good example, but they, they recognize that they need to focus on each member one at a time. They're not going to one-shot them all at once. And I think that's where Tufts, they want to try to one-shot them all at once, but they've not really been able to find more than just individual members. That third dragon is spawning about five seconds. Going to be the Mountain Soul. Going to be pretty important considering the beefy members that both of these teams have. And Isla does have the stun available. He's been very keen on finding the right target so far in the past couple of series with the Tibbers. And be very patient with that ability. Portal jump over the wall though, not gonna land the sleep. 
And Dickchick knows that he has the ability to just jump right back over the wall. No potential for some re-engage, but now with Justinian in that Meganar form, Tufts is going to probably try to go in as soon as possible. The Dragon has been started up by Youngest Lee on the backside. They're going to land There's again the onto Morn. Three-man Magnus Storm is welcomed out from Artemis, and Morn is already down. Belisarius is going to get stunned up as well. Easy Lake will fall on the backside, and it's three straight kills coming through from BCU. Looks like Justinian will trade one back, but on the other side, Youngest Lee will pick up his double kill onto Belisarius. The Nar is the last one alive after picking up his soul kill onto Thick Chick. And that is another team fight win for BCU. They go four for one. They're going to go up two to one in the Dragons as well as we hit the 20 minute mark. Yeah, this might be the fight that puts VCU over the top in this one. That is a dagger. Tufts look like they almost had the setup, but they didn't control the mid wave before taking the fight. So they got split up and such a great bubble and paddle star combo there from Thick Chick. Chunked out a couple of members on the backside and Artemis immediately pulling the trigger for his team, but this is a greedy Baron start I have to say from VCU, the respawns have already come through and it's going down so slowly, they're so low, they've not spent their gold. Just sitting just now, however, losing the Mega Nar. It's very scary. 5k HP on the Baron Youngest Lay going aggressive as well. They have that Feast Smite combo and they're gonna use it in just a couple of seconds unless Morn can get into the pit. It's gonna be McLeachy securing the objective, but the fight has already been happening. It's gonna be Morn taken down as well as Justinian. Ezra Allen doing his best in the middle of the entire VCU roster. We gonna flash away. Gonna get one kill back onto McLeachy, but Youngest Lay is gonna chase down as well. Allen is gonna run for the hills here, but it doesn't look too promising for him because then it played in to his death and that is the baron picked up as well gonna be 7,000 gold lead going in favor of vcu wow vcu they get away with murder on this one the jumbo's trying to get in there to contest but they did not have all their pieces in line once again another very spread out fight they're not able to find the one shot onto anyone and they just get so low before being entered walking one by one against this composition is a death sentence it is Baron to VCU, it is a gold lead to VCU, and with an insane siege composition with this Zoe Jin Graves, they should be able to help push down some of these turrets. As Belisar just got one shot. Yeah, he's gone. Boop, there he goes. Thick shit coming out with a paddle star ignite combo, and that was a dirty kill coming over into that Oof. middle lane. That and is, as you that said before, Hawk. This is the composition that VCU has set up. This is the scenario, their dream scenario. Getting this Baron, sieging down the turrets, got all of these zoning abilities. Got the Deadly Flourish and even the Curtain Call alongside this Zoe. Heck, you even got the Cho'Gath to throw some knockups down as well. It's gonna be really hard for, for Tufts to get anywhere near VCU as they try to siege down, especially with this Rift Herald coming in. It's gonna be so much power coming down onto the turrets and the game is definitely in jeopardy here. Yeah, absolutely. First inhibitor almost certainly going to go down here. You've already got the wave getting pushed up on the top side as well. They can immediately rotate over to that one, start hammering onto this tier two as they might try to usher in a second herald charge on the side. Or they're just going to try to fight the end of game. Oh, Youngest Lee's caught out though. That's going to be Belisarius taking him down. Artemis is still pushing down into the middle of the fight. Justinian's coming down with the teleport onto the back side. Blade Collar doing a decent amount of damage, but the Nar's got to be careful. Still in that mini form. Going to go down to Anticha as well. Two members are only alive right now for the Jumbos. 23 minutes into this game. Looks like VCU are going to try to push towards this game. One victory. Easy Life and Belisarius are going to try to do their darndest to save this one, but the Sleep will land. That's the Paddle Star oh. as well. The Nexus is open, Easy Life getting attacked under his own fountain, and in a quick 23-minute victory, VCU will go up 1-0 in the series. Blink and it's over! It seemed like just 15 minutes into this one, we had an even gold lead, but a couple of good fights from the Ram spell death for the Jumbos, and it is VCU taken over in a pretty dominant first game here. That was a utter domination over the past last seven minutes or so of that game. It just seemed like VCU knew exactly what to do at every moment. They picked the fights that they wanted. They got the objectives that they wanted. And they ended the game uh, nearly flawlessly towards the end there. And Tufts is going to have a lot to look um, towards in order to try and you know fix their, their mistakes, try to get into a better mindset for game number two. But it is, um, uh, it, it, Tufts does, you know, find themselves in this situation um, many times, actually. In two of their past series, you know, they were down 0-1 against both Rutgers and yesterday against Penn State. And they both came they came back to win both of those series. And so it, it's definitely not out of the question for them to come back. But man, that was a dominant victory to start the series off.
Yeah, no stranger to uh, being down are the Jumbos. Uh, they they certainly aren't too rattled, I'm sure, about this game number one, but that is definitely a tough loss to swallow because it felt like to me that the Jumbos got what they want. They left some of the comfort open for VCU saying, we've got counterpicks. The Annie for Easy Life there in the mid lane. That was the counterpick to the Zoe. They wanted that matchup, and to get Frankly, blasted in that fashion is definitely a tough one to swallow because now you've got to rethink your entire draft strategy. So um, definitely a really difficult one. Tufts, they need to just shake off that loss. They need to find a composition that they can execute upon better because I feel like VCU got everything comfortable for them. They got all their best champions. They knew how to execute on their win conditions, whereas Tufts seemed like they didn't quite know what they were supposed to do once they reached the mid-game in this one. They seemed like they were on the back foot for the entire game, even when they were in the driver's seat. They were playing reactively. So just want to see a little bit more proactivity coming out for them, but these two very, very clean map rotations throughout uh, you know, the later stage of the game. After that 15-minute mark, they started playing as a team, they won their team fights, and they ended efficiently. Well, we're receiving word that Jansu will return for game two. The starting roster for Tufts will be on the blue side in this next game. We're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with game two in Champion Select. Welcome back, everybody. We're here for game two between VCU and Tufts Blue. Um, ben, after that tough game one victory going over to VCU, looks like Tufts has made a bit of an adjustment in their lineup. They were running Allen as a sub for the last game. And so now it's going to be Jansu returning to that ADC position. Belisari is sliding back down into that support role as we're already back into the draft as we speak. It's going to be Tristana, Graves, Zoe, Senna, Elise, Kaisa taken away. Yep, we are 
already underway in this one. And as you mentioned, Johnson coming back into the lineup because I think the biggest issue that the Jumbos faced in game number one was a severe lack of coordination in team fights in particular. It just seemed like they didn't really know what their individual roles were in these fights, looking very scattered. VCU, on the other hand, very concise with their composition and knowing what they wanted to do and having your AD carry come back in, uh, you know, generally the person that you're looking to do carry those team fights. And Belisari is back on his main role, someone that can pull the trigger, as we have seen so many times, might be what Tufts need to breathe some life back into their composition because, frankly, VCU's early game, not the cleanest. So Tufts might be able to take advantage there as we saw the first pick hacker banned out in game number one coming through for Justinian. Olaf Rell immediately as a response. The Rell was so good from Artemis in game number one. Uh, and I expect to see great things in number two. And flying through it again, Shen for Justinian. A little bit more of a weak side matchup. They want to go all in on the fourth basket. Yeah, they're going to go with that Hecker and Shen combo. Shen still, you know, could be that flex pick going down into the support role. Not sure how much of the champion the Bell Star is being able to play. I'm actually surprised that we didn't see that B1 Rel coming in. I mean, that's something that we've seen so much. It's going to take away all my flex pick dreams for now, though, as Leona's going to get locked in to match up against the Rel. Going to send that Shen towards that top side. But it looks like they're really putting a lot of eggs into the Morn basket here, Hawk. They're going for Hecarim and the Shen and just adding a lot of synergy to that. And we'll see what they kind of try to decide to round out with with the mid bot lane. Hmm. Okay, so now this is interesting, seeing the victor coming through blind for VCU. They want to get what they deem to be the best control mage. Um, which I would say, compared to Sindra Ori, definitely not as good. Even the likes of Quirky, probably a little bit lower on the tier list. However, clearly, Thick Chick comfortable in the matchup uh, with the Zoe getting banned out. They're going to ban out other safe control mages, not allow Easy Life to get in Easy Lane <laughs> um, and force him onto something a little uh, less conventional, most likely. So, it will be interesting to see the bans as they move forward. Jin being taken away, piloted incredibly well by Anticha. As we said, it was a massive comfort pick for them as the Galio going to be banned away again. So yeah, they're forcing Easy Life to play something that he's not quite as comfortable on, forcing him to play a little bit more of a carry, something that Thick Chick can try to take advantage of in lane. To me, immediately, my mind goes to the Syndra. It is the strongest laner available. It does relatively well in the Victor, can control waves well, can uh, offer kill threat, but it's not exactly the kind of pick we're accustomed to seeing. Easy also, I want to say, Seraphine is still up. I mean, that's a champion that has gone untouched throughout this draft. Something that, you know, we don't normally talk about, especially this early. Mordekaiser, though, locked in. This is a little bit exciting. McLeachy going to be picking that counter into the Shen. Definitely does provide a lot of value, considering that the, the autos don't really get blocked or anything with that Spirit's Refuge. So having that more pickup definitely going to be pretty valuable. And it still has the potential to kind of play towards more of that like weak side or, you know, it doesn't really need that jungle attention. Uh, we'll be interested to see if Seraphine comes through here. I mean, Wood synergizes super well with the Hecarim, uh, obviously. And it's also something that Jansu can potentially play. But no, this is exciting. Vayne lock in for Jan. Match up alongside Belisari to Leona. Going to be a pretty powerful pick here. Gonna, they needed the DPS, to say the least. Needed the DPS, to say the least. Yeah, VCU with Aiden a really beefy composition but blind vein is definitely risky with so many long range ad options up and available caitlin jinx uh the two that immediately come to mind uh, as counters to this vein on the table and we do see comfort ari coming up for easy life and it's so interesting vcu deciding to save their ad carry pick for our fight they were so confident in the mid lane matchup with thick chick Winning off the counter pick, uh, or uh, in the counter matchup last time, they say even if he gets counter picked, we can win again. So it frees up some draft capital to take the Mordekaiser into the Shen. It's very good if you ever want to fight. Mordekaiser ults the Shen. He cannot join. So then they get a favorable matchup for Antacha in the bot lane. Sivir would not have been my first choice for a counter to the Sivir, but can certainly do very well, particularly against this Leona with the spell shield to block the initial engage. It has the wave shove, keep Bane under turret, try to find roam timers for Artemis, which could be very scary. So very interesting drive coming through from both sides. I feel like Tuff's going back to a little bit of comfort. Again, Leona, not really what I would consider a top tier support at the moment. Ari, definitely not a top tier mid laner, but something that these players are confident on. Yeah, and the Sivir is interesting because it's something that really has risen in popularity over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, 
um, uh, in, in, in the past meta is definitely not something that we would typically see, but it's been a new build kind of rising uh, in popularity. Things like Duskblade and Mana Mune coming through onto the Sivir. It'll be interesting to see if they actually manage to go through that, especially considering how tanky some of these members of Tufts are, especially towards that top side with the Hector and Shen. We'll be interested to see what more decides to itemize though on this on this Hector as well. You know, did get a bunch of the base damage on the Q taken away, so definitely scales better with the attack damage builds, things like the Trinity Course of Divine Sunder early on. And yeah, it looks like uh, Hecarim has kind of been falling a little bit out of favor with that Turbo Chem Tank, and it'll be interesting to see what he decides to pick up here, especially considering a lot of the defensive capabilities with alongside um, Shen. Absolutely. I fully expect to see a crit build coming through from Anticha. I don't think you really ha can afford to go lethality against what is basically a triple frontline from Tufts, especially with the amount of engage that they are packing. Uh, playing poke like that, not what you want, and you want the consistent AD damage to come out should your Olaf fall behind. VCU already having really high DPS in these team fights to try to melt through that frontline of the Jumbos, and I think the Saver just adds to that, especially the ability to get on top of this Ari and Ola. Uh, uh, Vayne, excuse me, with the Olaf, so would imagine Anticha is looking that way, and as you mentioned, uh, the Chem Tank Hecarim build not really as good on the current patch. Divine Sunder, still very good. Hecarim itself still extremely powerful on the current patch despite the Q base damage nerf, but I would expect to see a Sunder build. Yeah, and it looks like Tufts has, has sort of, I don't know, reverted back to comfort. In a way, things like Easy Life's Ari, one of his most played champions, the constant, um, Belisari, sorry, is Leona. Uh, back when he was known as Constantine Valdor, definitely pulled that out a lot towards the beginning of the season. And the Hecarim coming through from Morn, another one of his most played champions. Interestingly enough, though, decided to pick that first with that Olaf still available. So Olaf, you know, that prototypical counter into the Hecarim. So we'll be interested to see how um, how Youngest Slay really manages to, to play out this early game as well, just especially considering the amount of, of impact that he had early on in that first game, as even on a champion like Graves. Absolutely. Uh, Hecarim Olaf, the potential to be a wildly snowballing matchup, just like the Olaf Graves. Basically, any matchup with Olaf can turn into a stomp going one way or the other. Hecarim, definitely a very just safe champion in general, because even in uh, quote unquote losing matchups, it still has the ability to just farm up and be a beast in team fights. Um, whereas Olaf sort of has the burden of trying to generate an advantage, but we did see last game that Youngest Lay was able to do that just on the first clear. Um, I would expect both teams' Raptor camps to be very contested. Mid lane shove will be a priority. Both Ari and Victor have tremendous shove potential to try to push out. Let their jungler have the winning mid jungle wave matchup. Walk into the mid jungle, get visioned out, start tracking, get those earlier setups for objectives, which I feel like VCU did better last game with their winning mid lane. So that's something that the Jumbos desperately will need to shore up in this game number two. Certainly so. I mean, just I feel like the early game was, was once again, as you said, Hawk, back and forth. Tons of like kills going over. Really hard to tell who was walking away at with the advantageous position. As we got towards those middle game stages though, kind of showed the team coordination differences here between the Jumbos and the uh, team of VCU. You know, just a lot of different um, play styles that really erupted there. And, and Tufts sitting there with that sub in um, their support role. Alan obviously is a coach, but is a little bit different obviously when you have a new player coming through in communications and in comms and things like that. So uh, hopefully now with this new revamped Back to the OG lineup, to, to say the least. Tufts will potentially have a lot better of um, uh, n knowledge on when to go in and things like that, and you know, try to bring their team fighting a little bit better towards those later stages. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say that the composition for Tufts is easier to execute than last time around. I feel like last time it was sort of needing to find that one, two, three, everybody dive in and blow up the enemy. You know, you gotta have Nar starting off the fight, Annie flashing in immediately on top of that, Olaf trying to Ragnarok his way through. But this time around, you've got a lot more individual agency, I think, and a lot more, uh, I think, just defensive utility on this team, whereas uh, last time around, it was all go buttons, no stop. Uh, so when they weren't able to pull the trigger when they were playing on the back foot, it was really difficult for them to find opportunities. I think with this sort of composition, you've got a lot of ways to go in. You've got a lot of ways to run away. Um, you've just generally got more options. But speaking of options, the composition from 
VCU, the tried and true, run at them and kill them all. There's so much damage and tankiness on this team. If you let them just stack up as five and death ball at you, that is an unstoppable force. So Tufts has to find a way to try to spread out these fights. Let their single target damage carries try to find opportunities to single out members, whittle them down, and take them out. Yeah, I, I'm shivering right now just thinking about an Olaf Rel getting um, getting hit with that Sivir ultimate as well. Just going to provide so much movement speed forward, so much engage potential as well. Stylistically, though, Tuff's composition is a little bit different than the one that they've been bringing up in past games. Uh, playing a little bit less around Justinian. You know, typically, you would you, we would say that you know Justinian is one of their main carries, one of their best players. But he's back now on Shen duty, and they're putting a lot. Of, of pressure to say the least on to Jansu's vein. I'm expecting to see a lot of dives happen bot lane with the Hecarim Shen combo, trying to get this vein ahead. As you know, if she can get those few kills, snowball those leads, get those items, can definitely be super impactful. But we'll see what happens and we'll see if that happens because if it doesn't, it looks like Tufts is going to go home uh, in the CSL playoffs and move VCU on to the next round. And so, you know, yeah, yeah, we'll see what happens there. Got game two action happening in just a bit. We'll see in a couple minutes after the spectator relay.
Welcome back, everybody. We're here for game number two for Tufts University. This could be their final trot down Summoner's Rift in the CSL playoffs. Fought ben, there's just so much pressure riding on these these team members, these players had this whole season building up to this. And, and you know, against a super strong team here in BCU Black, definitely don't want to go down without a fight. Definitely not wanting to go down and fight. And if last game was any indication, I don't think it will be without a fight. Andrew, these teams were at each other's throats for the first I, at least 15 minutes of the last game. We had like 21 kills at 15 minutes. And although VCU yeah. managed to explode the game very quickly from that point, Tufts was absolutely in that one for the better uh, part of that game. BCU making plenty of mistakes of their own in the early game, and now they've got Shatsu back. They've got their main man. They've got the AD carry. They've got him on the vein. Yeah. He might just be able to bring them over the finish line. A lot of pressure riding on Jansu, sitting out that and not being able to make it to that first game. But now all the eggs are in to the basket of him going on to this hyper carry on the vein. A lot of the damage will be going through this player here, but. Level 1 shenanigans already underway here. Gonna go for a delayed invade here with Youngest Lay and the rest of BCU bot lane. The only thing though that really will help though is that this time Jumbos really know what's going on and could potentially look to try and counter with an invade of their own. Yeah, but Youngest Lay could actually, he could try to go red to red. Uh, not necessarily what you want to be doing on Olaf if you want to full clear, but oh, he's trying going. to vertical on this bottom side is so advantageous because we were just talking about how Jansu so much in his hands. So if you have the Olaf permanently on the bottom side with no chance of Morn able to counter, then this Vayne is at permanent risk in this game. So Youngest Lay going to have so much pressure over this game. They know Morn going for the vertical. He's opting into it, but... I mean, the Shen Mordekaiser matchup, while getting Mordekaiser behind would be nice, it doesn't really matter. Getting a Shen ahead is not all that important. Meanwhile, getting the Vayne behind is so big. And look at this youngest light. He is doing the path that I talked about. He's going to try to go red to red. He wins this 1v1 early game. The Hecarim just doesn't have the damage. And with the red buff on him as well. Oh. Here it is. Light has begun. Smite already used there by Youngest Lay, but Justinian has the push. Gonna land the flash taunt, and that's gonna be Youngest Lay going down first. Blood to Morn. The, the, the invade has been punished, and McLeachy is the next target. Justinian gonna be forced to run away. Meanwhile, on the bottom side, Sun's gonna land onto two, and TG is gonna have the flash burn. The ignite's ticking. The W out. The crash. Artemis away from the fight, but Easy Life has joined the party. Taunt's gonna land again onto McLeachy. There's the flash charm. Gonna get flashed away from in return. Beautiful reaction time coming out from that Mord. Dick Chick is here though, and Youngest Lay making his way back. The interesting thing about that play though, the red buff was not taken, which means that Youngest Lay will have the opportunity to secure that objective for himself. He does die, does secure the three buff. It's an interesting creative event. Yeah, Youngest Lay, he wins the 1v1, but Andrew, it wasn't a 1v1. <laughs> Justinian roaming down from the top lane right there. He has the wave pressure against the Mordekaiser. The taunt flash into the one shot. Olaf gets taken down. And although Youngest Lay will be able to take his red buff and will have a camp lead in this one, I'm sure more not feeling too sad about getting first blood to his name. That will catapult him towards that early divine Sunderer. So good stuff. Tufts already 1,000 gold in the driver's seat with McLeachie yeah. as well. Missing so many minions. So two birds with one stone. The Mordekaiser is behind and the Hecarim is ahead. Yeah, and it was so crucial of Justinian to have that wave crashing in as early as possible. Morn knew that there was going to be some intervention around that red buff and wanted to make sure that he had that numbers advantage before Youngest Lay ended up getting there. And so a beautiful time to push led into a beautifully timed kill. Youngest Lay now sitting at 1 and 0 and Morn sitting out with this Conqueror as well, basically signifying a AD sort of build here, not going for that phase rush as McLeachie getting chunked out heavily with those key strikes and be forced to take a recall. Yeah, Justinian looking pretty good up here in this top lane so far. You wouldn't really expect Shen to beat up on the Mordekaiser, but the base damage is simply higher for the Shen early on. Mordekaiser doesn't really have any of that AP built up. Stopping off for the Cloth Armor, collapsing to the pressure. And this one, Easy Life going to set up the freeze as well. Thick Chick going to be feared the potential of a gank. He does have a support and jungler behind him. And you know, that play just around the red buff, the youngest lay deciding to uh, hold that thought. Uh, Easy Life's in trouble. Thick Chick knew he had Artemis on the way. 
did not flinch in terms of that 1v1. Knew he had the support coming, which meant that he didn't have to burn the flash or anything. And that just means a kill going over. Easy Life gets punished for the freeze. Not all too bad though, as you know, it's just not, it's just gonna be him returning. Born's gonna pick up some of the CS, does go for the early tabbies. As uh, meanwhile, as well, look at the bot lane, Ben. It looks like Jansu has built up a freeze of his own, as well as that 13 CS lead. Yeah, easy life. I feel like you almost have to expect that the support was behind Thick Chick as he tries to set up the freeze, just taking too much damage from those minions in a great roam down, trapping him between a rock and a hard place right there, or a rock and a, a horse, I suppose. Uh, metal horse. It's, it's metal, metal horse. horse yeah. So it is. It is a hard horse. So we're gonna go with it. Um, as we see the taunt on the top side. So good kill in the mid lane, getting the victor ahead, but Miklaichi is gonna die. Yeah, no flash available on McLeishi. Does actually manage to run far enough to prevent the devastating charge from going back in to their opponents. Going straight into the tower means that Morn can't re-engage. It's gonna leave Justinian here with the wave state in a pretty good spot, I would say. And without that teleport, McLeishi is gonna be losing a whole lot of resources here in this early game. Yeah, absolutely nice freeze by Justinian, but so much attention again being thrown to the Shen, and while McLeishi very far behind in this lane. It has been at the cost of the mid lane, and Victor definitely a little bit more of a carry. So, will be interesting to see if the pressure that has gone through each of these lanes will have been worth it for both these teams. As uh, Youngest Slave basically just been power farming since their early game. And I will say, that is the best boots cloth armor purchase I've seen in my entire life, because that is the entire reason Miklichi lived that gank. I mean, the, the movement speed was there, you know, prevented some of the extra physical damage from going down as well. I would say that was a, a pretty big brain move for him, but Youngest Lei going aggressive on this top side as well. Gonna try to prevent Morn from going for this Rift Scuttler as Justinian now things level 6. We'll have that same unit available for the Justinian next hasn't backed yet. Yeah, first recall. look at the items. Hasn't thought. Still sitting at around 1700 gold with that Doron shield. Could back at any time. Does have the teleport available as well. Probably gonna pick up something like the Bambi Cinder as looking at the mid lane. Chaos Storm already issued onto Easy Life. Just gonna be used to zone out Easy Life, Dang. but Ninja gonna be forced to flash. And that's Morn coming in as well. And Youngest Lei goes down for the second time. Beautiful synergy. That's the Hecarim Shen that we were talking about. Gonna be an easy kill down into the bot side jungle as Youngest Lake is punished for the invade. Yeah, punished for the invade. You cannot be there. You are a level 5 Olaf. It's almost 8 minutes into the game. He was probably one or two camps away from that level 6. Just find the XP. Get to that Ragnarok. That is your power spike. Instead, he walks in, gets taken down. Another kill going the way of Hecarim. And Andrew, I just want to talk about this for a second. Every single lane for. Tufts is winning except for the mid lane. Thick Chick 500 gold ahead of Easy Life, but Justinian 500 gold ahead of his opposite number. Morn 700 gold ahead of his, and then even Jinsu on the bottom side 400 gold up. 20 CS advantage over the Sivir. The counterpick Sivir not working out at all. So Tufts feeling very good about the early lane states, having over a 1,000 gold lead, and although. The dragon was taken by VCU. This mid-game spiking composition here. This Hecarim coming online, buying so much pressure for Tufts. And again, I said that their window was to exploit VCU's sloppy early game, and so far they have done so. Yeah, I look at that CS advantage coming through. And Ticha is going to pick up a lot because of that big wave that crashed into the turret before Jansu ended up going for that back. But now sitting at a, a pretty sizable advantage, to say the least, sitting at around 600 gold up in terms of itemization. Youngest Lay finally going to pick up his red buff once more. But yeah, overall, um, things are really working out much better for the Jumbos at this point. It's going to be Justinian going to, again for the aggressive trade onto McLeishi, but the Death Realm is available. Doesn't know if that's going to be issued just yet. Gonna dodge away from the E. There's the ultimate pop. Justinian's going to have to be careful. Going to have to get under the turret. Make sure that he stays alive here. That's not... That's kind of the, the aspect of that 1v1 situation. Why McLeishi picked this Mordekaiser into the Shen, despite the matchup not necessarily being super well off in, in terms of, of just champion strength. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're starting to see that percent damage from the Mordekaiser really doing a lot of work in that 1v1. Justinian winning the initial trade, but not winning the extended force to walk out without the taunt available. But you see a 1v1 in the mid lane, does he get on the Chaos Storm? He gets stunned up by the gravity field. That could be the thing that decides it, but it's not. Thick Chick goes down to solo kill from Easy Life, and Morn's going on to the backside as well in the bottom lane. Gonna tank up the tower, let Jansu get fed a little bit more. Gonna pick up a nice kill in the 2v2 onto Artemis as that is a 3 for 0 in total for Tufts. Dragon's on the table in about 30 seconds, and they're going to have the pressure. 
There it is from Tusk. Whenever you see a jungler get ahead like Horn, like something on this Hecro, you want to see if he's able to bring it to his laners. And there it is, the gank on the bottom side, getting a kill for the vein, going on a killing spree himself. And then Easy Life getting revenge for game number one in the middle lane. Coming back up from the respawn, we see the Shen coming in. Somebody called the Pony Express because they've delivered a Shen. Ragnarok pop onto Youngest Lay, but he's not going to get any tankier because of that ultimate. Going to get flashed on by Justinian. The final auto will do, and three straight deaths coming out from the challenger jungler. Six to one in favor of the Jumbos. Two and a half thousand gold lead. Getting punished over and over again on these over aggressive plays with the dragon spawn doesn't look like anyone's going to take it just yet as the jumbo's back but look at this early game so much better coming out of the jumbo's they're doing their homework here in this one absolutely just a really nicely played early game this time the reactive style working so much better youngest lay just looking lost on the map not respecting where the laners for Tufts can be at any given time, getting taken down for the third time. And now that is a kill going over to the Shen. Every lane firing on all cylinders right now. And with Dragon on the map, the bot lane behind for VCU, you would have to think. Morn going to pass down to this side right now. Should be able to take that one away. Onslaught of Shadows coming up in just about 30 seconds. Harold going to be summoned in the mid lane here to try to generate some pressure. But it was too early. The wave is still there. And the response coming through. Look at the blue wards around this dragon. Yeah, it, it, it's very difficult for VC to do anything here. The Rift Herald coming down, gonna get some plate gold, gonna get some pressure with the dragon spawn. It's gonna be Youngest Lay ended up starting that one up. But Warren is here. Onslaught of Shadows coming up in just a little bit. And here comes the teleport and the in as well. Five members strong coming out from the jumbo. And Ticha already has the spell shield burned. And that means that a two man will lock both of them up. And Ticha goes down and it's now seven to one in favor of the Jumbos. Fighting out of 4v5 in the next couple of seconds means that that's, it's an easy Drake to take. And, and Morn getting that extra movement speed on the Cloud Drake gonna be super valuable onto him as now Morn's gonna do some counter jungling of his own. Youngest Lay is gonna play. get taken down. There's the final hour pop by Jansu going aggressive with the tumbles. Not gonna be able to go and find a kill 1v2, but Youngest Lay chunked out of his own jungle. Morn is doing everything after that early game shenanigan. Such a better setup than what uh, Tufts was showing us in game number one. Justinian with an incredible TP to cordon off the members as a group of three and a group of two around that blue buff. And Easy Life diving into the group of three, fearlessly baiting out all of the defensive utility from the Saver. No flash available, no spell shield, trying to dodge out on that charm. And a fantastic solo fight from Belisarius coming out over the top, buying the space for his team to get the dragon. But Easy Life, you need to be careful, you don't have any cooldowns. Yeah, Easy Life doesn't have the ability to lock up a Ragnarok to Olaf, and this could be a potential turn here for VCU. Belisari is gonna dodge away from the stun coming out from the crash down, but Youngest Lay is continuing to go in. That's the pullback coming through from McLeachy. Youngest Lay will get some respite for his trouble. He's gonna pick up two straight kills for himself in the top side jungle, and he's getting right back into this game. Uh, and, and they're gonna continue to contest here on the blue buff. Morn is available here. Gonna pop the Poro emote, but oh. McLeachy's gonna get stick Morn into this 1v1 for the next couple of seconds. It's gonna allow Youngest Lay to take down that blue buff and the onslaught of shadows is available upon re-entry and Morn's gonna come back in with the stand united gonna send Justinian back into the into the fray but gonna be careful now sitting in a 1v3 gonna taunt out safely and nobody's gonna die but a nice play coming out from the VCU team we're gonna fight right back and steal away the camps like they did early on and Morn is just gonna have to sit and watch his jungle go down easy life gonna try to dash in though with the spirit rush beautiful challenge Charm. over the blast cone solar flare is gonna stun up the Ragnarok with jungler that's gonna be the magnet storm locking him down but now all the members of Tufts are here make it four strong they get three straight kills and once again VCU get punished Oh, I feel like the theme of this series, Andrew, is not respecting resets. It first start with easy life. I, after the dragon, just half HP, no cooldowns. Why are you walking in the river where you have no control? He gets taken down and it allows VCU to walk in, try to contest the blue buff, but they take too long again and get caught up. Three more kills in the back pocket of Tufts. It ends up being another advantageous play for the Jumbos. They're going to get mid priority. They're going to shove out their lanes, get favorable reset, more gold into their back pockets. This is a 4 and 0. Oh, Hecrim, 5,000, nearly 6,000 gold to his name. He is by far the richest person on the Rift today. And he is off more and is off to just, just the races on this one. And remember, Hawk, this is not that typical chem tank, you know, force of nature Hecarim that we've been seeing. This is a Divine Sunderer Hecarim 
getting that damage, you know, coming at with the nerfs of the base damage, gonna make sure that he keeps this uh, damage pumping through here. And he's still gonna be pretty tanky to boot, especially considering that Justinian also has a bit of a lead for himself towards his top side. The beefy frontline of the Jumbos will allow for a lot of these heavy damage dealers like Jansu to fight and fire their bullets into the back side. And look at the trades coming out. This is supposed to be a matchup that McLeachy wins, but so much chunk coming out from Justinian as well. Yeah, just really doing a good job playing around that short Q cooldown, getting the grass procs, trying to not like, let McLeachy set up that passive to start doing the real damage and we've seen it so much better this game the jumbos understanding what their composition is supposed to do i feel like they did not have that in game number one but this time around they know how to fight they know what their strengths are they know what they need to do to exploit vcu's composition and we've not really seen vcu be able to set up the death ball it's so much harder when you're behind to just press your buttons and run at somebody but with Harold on the map, they are stacking up as five. They are setting up for that death ball. And with Vayne on the bottom side, you have to think that this will be BCU's Harold. As you can see the ghost getting popped. Ghost popped, Ragnarok popped on the hunt. Pop Belisari is going to get popped soon as well. The Stand United will buy some time, but not going to bring Justinian over. And now he's actually stuck towards that tower as well. It's going to be five number strong headed towards that second rift Harold. Again, not the most important objective to go for, but always something that can generate some pressure. Easy life can be careful though fighting in that 3v5. Remember, going to have to use the Spirit Rush to dash away safely. And they leave Jansu down in the bottom lane this whole time. Don't hate this trade, honestly. Going to get a nice couple of waves, a lot of XP. Going over to the vein, going to funnel some more gold into him. In response, you're going to lose maybe a half of a turn. Yeah, I, I would say that this is a worth trade for Tufts if they don't give over the kill, but regardless, they get the first turret gold and solo gold at that onto their vein as well as a lot of farm. So although going the kill, uh, excuse me, the kill going over is not ideal, it's not the end of the world. And second Herald, not really the most impactful objective. They're gonna get the dragon on the backside uh, to boot. So they're feeling pretty good about this one, but that is the death ball in action. Belisari is, despite the flash, is simply not able to get out from the perma slows of the Olaf, the chase down potential of the Sivir, of this Rel, with the attract repel stun. So nicely played there from uh, VCU to try to find something while behind, try to find themselves a trade, but it is advantages. Tufts, nonetheless, we mentioned Jansu, he's being given the tools to carry 101 Kraken Slayer online. He's got the highest farm in the game. He's got the first turret of money. He is poised to be able to do it in game number two. Yeah, the, the early acceleration, sorry, coming out from Jansu is super important, especially considering now he's at that level advantage, got the first tower, as you said, Hawk. Um, but yeah, you're gonna have a lot of ability to kind of, you know, continue to fire down. But we did see glimpses of what VC want to accomplish as we head later into this game towards some of those dragon fights, towards some of these fights around corridors where literally VCU can just run straight in and, and hope for the best that they end up winning. But I think Tufts does have a decent amount of, of disengaged potential. They have Shen and Leona, two champions that can go aggressive, but can also, you know, play that other role of sort of the disengage. Morn is, again, another champion that kind of really does like going in, but, you know, Jansu and Easy Life both have these dashes, you can kite back. Not going to be uh, the, the hardest thing to do to, to match up against VCU's comp. Yep, and it's just like what I talked about in draft. It comes down to whether or not the Jumbos are able to buy enough space in these team fights. Because if VCU is able to stack up his five and just run at you, you're never going to kill them. But Tufts, they've got a lot of tools to buy that space. And the man I'm going to watch is more. And if he's able to get good onslaughts of shadows into the middle of multiple members, try to spread them out. As we see an attempt on a city in the bottom side, he's trying to trade it back. Yeah, I mean, he knows he's dead. Might as well try to go for a trade. He's going to land one more Q would have done the deal. Stuck on the 3v1 though, Justinian is gonna go shield. down eventually. Gonna have the shields actually. Will he get out safely? The answer is no, gonna die on that backside. But in return, Morn will pick up one back onto the Victor. Thick Chick gonna go down and the tower is now under fire. Justinian bought just enough time for his team to make the dive happen on the Thick Chick. And not only that, he blew the flash off the AD carry. And although losing the taunt flash is not ideal, getting the flash off of the Sivir is so monumental for these coming fights because now when Morn jumps in when Belisarius is looking for those solar flares if the spell shield is down he will be getting caught up and although he has the cleanse it could just be the split second is all you really need to get on top of the Sivir and take him down we saw how squishy he really is really nicely played there from Justinian and did 
Did Antichia have the Gale Force up available for that fight? Because it is uh, not, not currently sure. on cooldown. I, I, it, it might have been a situation where he didn't actually have it in his inventory. Because um, I remember the last time I checked the itemization, which was, to be fair, a couple of minutes ago, it was just the components to that Gale Force, so I don't know if he actually did have that item available. Either way, though, as you said, Hawk, getting that flash off the Sivir Champion, who does really enjoy playing safe with the cleanse, with the spell shield, just adding that extra layer of protectivity, getting taken off the board for these later fights, definitely going to be impactful as, you know, the dive potential for Tufts is certainly there. Yep, for sure. We already see the setup in the mid lane. They want this mid lane turret. They know it's low. They know that Dragon's spawning him in and happen to expect Tuff. I want to see them. They're getting the vision set up now. You want to try to shove up mid wave. You want to try to shove up bot wave. And then on the next wave, go for a recall. Restock all of your wards. Come back. Replace your vision. And try to make a play. But VCU, they're not going to allow that to happen. They know that they need to take control. Not allow Tufts to get that favorable reset. They drop the arrow. They're going to take down this mid lane turret. Secure themselves some map control before this dragon. This is a big one. Tufts trying to find that infernal soul point. But... BCU, if they're able to tie it up 2-2, two to two, that makes the Dragon score so much closer. And so interesting, we're seeing pressure moving towards the top side. Scuttle Crab on the menu, but with Dragon spawning in a minute, that's a lot of damage. Ragnarok forced out. Yeah, Youngest Lay hitting the taunt spin. That's going to be a dead Olaf. Elisari is going to come in and swoop up the kill. That is a dead jungle for the next 30 seconds. Not going to actually um, be dead while the Dragon spawns, but getting that huge tempo advantage. Definitely massive for the Jumbos here. Looks like even that Olaf and the rest of VCU went for the play towards that Rift Herald at the wrong time. I mean, Dragon wasn't spawning for around a minute uh, when they decided to drop the Herald. Don't know if the cooldown was about to expire or not. Either way though, 25 seconds until that Elder Dragon spawns, Youngest Lay will be available for the fight, but you know what won't be available? That ultimate. Yeah, VCU, they got the mid pressure that I talked about, but then they sent it to the wrong side of the map. Why do you care about the top raver? Walk in to the bottom side, clear out the vision that Tufts have put down and enforce him the face check, but instead it is Youngest Lake going down. However, it is a lot of resources committed from the Jumbos that are not available for this dragon. Easy like not going to have the Fear Rush available, but likewise, Youngest Lake, although he has respawned, no Ragnarok up. So, crucial ultimate down, Shen, Stand United available. This is the death ball, however. Easy Life zoned off the other side of the fight. Death Realm is huge from McLeach. You're gonna allow Youngest Lay to have the smite for free down into the jungle to pick up that first objective. Tie the dragon score up at two to two. And that is the power of this VCU team composition. Doesn't really matter that they don't have the inner workings on the dragon because they can run straight into you and force you back. It's gonna be them picking up the dragon as Justinian wasn't even there. He's gonna get the damage on the tower. Knew he could jump in with the ultimate if the fight erupted, but now he's getting some pressure, getting some harm for himself. Not all too bad. That is the power of VCU's composition on full display. They simply walk in as five, daring the Jumbos to challenge them. And a great death run from McLeish. He buys in the space. No blood is shed, but it is an Infernal Dragon. Second of the game going the way of VCU. But we see McLeish forced off the top lane turret, however. Tufts, they're not taking their foot off the gas pedal. Both these teams, they're now trading on opposite sides of the map. It is no longer aimless map rotations like we saw in game number one. Tufts, they're trying to set up the plays as a team. They're trying to set up the vision. They are trying to trade back and forth. Neither team letting the other make a move without giving an inch. Oh, Morn might be caught out, actually. Onslaught of Shadows is available. Not going to use it just yet, but he is continuing to get slowed up by the Axes. Your final hour popped by Jansu um, in just a couple of seconds here. But I want to go back to McLeachy just for a second. That dragon fight showed the power of this Mordekaiser, you know, death roaming Morn, preventing him from getting in to try to steal the dragon, allowing Youngest Lay to get the inner hand and ended up taking down that objective. I wouldn't be surprised to see a QSS even come out from Morn soon, just so he can be available to even go for those 50 50s down the line. Yeah, and not only are you removing the potential of a smite, but that is the 505 Hecker. That yeah. is currently the strongest member on the side of Tuff, so removing him from the fight means that there is no way in hell that the Jumbos can take that one, and fortunately, they understood that. They did not bite off more than they could shoot. Easy Life, you know, popping his head over, trying to steal the dragon, not able to get it, but no more was burned, but Tufts, they've got to figure out how to set up these dragons just a little bit better to prevent the death ball from going. I like Justinian trying to leverage the split push pressure that the Shen does have with the Stand United, but I feel like you need to be TPing preemptively on 
that pick as the Scarlet Crab is still stolen away. To try to find some sort of flank, because as I said, you need to buy space. You cannot let the five-man unit of VCU stack up because they will win these fights every single time if they are together. Yeah, it, that's, the, that's the question. What can Tusk really do to, to, to counter this cop that uh, essentially the bowling ball comp, to say the least, that, that VCU have set up? You know, they can just run straight at you. That's what they do. They're going to have to just kite out really well. And it's going to be hard for them to, to, to really do that, especially considering things like Beyond the Hunt is available, Ragnarok and the Ghost coming out from Youngest Slay. And now Thick Chick might actually be in a bit of trouble, Cop, between three members of Puffs. The CC lock, Thick Chick nice won't even be able to type, hey, that's not fair in all chat, because he gets stunned up for eternity and gets taken down. Yep, nice pick. He was assuming that Tufts would be on the top side of the map, trying to pressure around this mid lane turret with the way pressure that they had. He gets taken down, trying to ward as we see an attempt to... Yeah, anti Chow gonna force the Gale Force. Tufts is in the base of VCU right now with this dive composition, and that might be a bit concerning. The Magnus Storm is gonna lock up the for just a little bit, but the Death Storm has There's been issued by Mikishi on to Morn. Gonna drag him back and actually miss the Obliterate, but the Flash Forward will cause Morn to fall. A big shutdown now going over onto that more. John Su now gonna have to be careful. Dodges away from the attractor. Penal Artemis is gonna run straight into Belisarius. His arms and John Su will pick up the kill, but now he's diving straight oh, into of PCU. Can he do enough damage? Gonna condemn. The Gonna, get into the wall. Gonna get a double kill. The solar flare will lock down and teach and he will go down too. How is Johnson still alive? He'll pick up his third of the game. What the He's, hell? The fight. He's got the triple. Can he get the quad? The chick is running, but the damage is too much. In the vein, a quadra kill. The security ace from the jumbos. He will fall in return. But what a display coming out from the replacement player here in game two. John Su walking into game number two. He says, give me the vein and dodges everything in that fight. 1v4 picking up the quadra kill. What an incredible display from the 80 carry of Tufts Blue. My God, that was an absolute vein clinic. And he takes the fight. He takes the tier two turret. What an incredible play tough they dove so deep into the base more and getting taken down by mclechi on the back side but the vein shows up and cleans up the fight with dragon now spawning in 10 seconds both teams respawning no summoner spells available on the vein so i will be surprised if he's able to do that again but don't count this guy out qss online phantom dancer online kraken has been there 3,000 gold in the lead soul point for both teams dragon has spawned and Easy Life is going aggressive alongside Belisarius. It looks like Tufts is not really in the picture just yet, but here comes more, and that's the delivery system coming through once again. But it's going to be Justinian joining him on the outside of the Death Realm. They're going to lock up Artemis, but that's not too much, but Morn's winning the 1v1 inside of the Death Realm, but Jansu goes down, as does Morn, and Belisarius will soon follow. Jansu ended up getting caught out, not going to be able to dish out the damage, and PCU find the fight that they need. They're going to secure the soul point, they're going to secure the 3 for 0. They secure the 3 for 0, and after Tufts takes an incredible fight up in the mid lane, it's VCU's turn, and this Mordekaiser is a problem. Ulting up Morn one more time, and the space for the carries was not there. The death ball coming online. Uh, I believe you called it the bowling ball, Andrew. That is a strike if I've ever seen one. They run right through the back line, and they take them down. Baron being started up. TP available on Justin. He is walking over Morn. Responding two seconds, but it's going down so fast. This should be an uncontested Baron going over to the Rams. And just like that, Soul Point, and they're wearing purple. They're back in the game. Dragon was taken. Gold lead is even. Baron buff gone. VCU has clawed their way, kicking and screaming back into this one. And now 29 minutes in, this is anybody's game for the taking. VCU wants to close out the series in a clean sweep and Tufts does not want to go home just yet. If you thought that Jansu was strong before in that fight though, Ben, take a look at the items now. That was a 1-0 main going in there. Now sitting with those five kills, working towards that infinity edge. Gonna be a lot of damage to try and survive this Baron push. But you gotta be careful because if Jansu ends up getting caught, that is going to be the basically doom coming out from the jumbos. And so the positioning has to be perfect. Gotta make sure that they play these fights well if they wanna take the win. Yep, you've gotta find the spread out fights. You need to let this vein 
three-hit a single member. If there are multiple targets, if it's a target-rich environment, she can't split her damage, and she will just get run down in that immaculate mid lane fight that we saw. Jansu basically had a series of consecutive 1v1s, and that's why he was able to focus down individual members and burst them out as we see Deathball set up in the middle lane. Teleport up on the Mordekaiser, but Stan United is available, and the Mordekaiser is not there to death run. I actually would like to see an engage from Tufts around this tier two onto the Victor. No flash as well on Antichia, but they're just gonna play the siege game. That Sivir, that Victor doing so much damage under this turret. Power is sure to fall. Nice and charm though on Antichia. Gonna force this land out. A lot of damage. Field. And now with Mr. Leechy, with Leechy, sorry, in that top side. Looks like the siege will continue because the waves are going to continue to crash. The death rays will do a lot, as will those boomerangs coming out from Antisha once he heals up just a little bit more. The inhibitor tower is the next on the menu coming through from DCU. Tough space is now under fire. Belisari is sitting at around half HP. He's got to be careful, but here comes the flank. This is the fight that the jumbos need. They're going to land the knockup onto Antisha. It's Morn and Justinian against the back line. They're going to take down the AD carry. Jansu is still alive on the back side of the fight, but Morn will fall. Justinian's going to have to flash away. Easy Life is still here. Still has the ultimate available. The Ignite is nearly off of cooldown as well. Jansu still left untouched in the fight. It's a one for one. Yeah, Jansu left untouched in that one, but Visu immediately recognized that they need to stay together. So as soon as the dive goes into the backside, instead of chasing onto the backline of uh, Tufts and letting Jansu pop off on the backside of that fight, they turn around, they burst out the Hecarim, and although it is a one for one, they took down the 80 carry, it will stall the Baron push, and Visu forced to go for a reset. Dragon, soul, spawning in a minute 45, and that will be the fight. Summoner spells up on Jansu Flash, back available on Antichia, but there will be no Flash this time on the Thick Chick on the Victor. And this is going to be the very crucial two minutes for this series. Baron buff won't be available on to VCU, and they weren't able to crack open the Jumbo base. No inhibitor taken down, no super minions pummeling into the into the Nexus towers. So it means that Tusk really still has the opportunity to continue to scale, continue to get these items. See, the Infinity Edge has been completed for Jansu. And Easy Life is also working towards that Horizon Focus. Probably not going to have that by the time the fight unfolds. But now, with the Baron power play, it's going to be the Gold League going in favor of VCU. They're going to have the inner hand on the Dragon to start this one off. And it's, it's going to be interesting. It's, we're going to have to see um, what the positioning really means for a lot of these AD carries. It feels like that is going to be this deciding factor. Which AD carry can stay alive the longest? Because they're the, the most primary damage on a lot of these teams. And if, if, if either of them go down, the, the fight certainly wants the other team. Easy Life going to try to go aggressive here. Going to dash forward with the Spirit Rush. But there's three members of ECU here. He's got to be careful. That is a crucial cooldown already taken off the board for this Dragon fight. And he's going to pick up the red buff on the side to make sure that he has that extra true damage coming in from the autos. And it is so tense right here. Yeah, so tense. But here they come. The unit of ECU. They've got the setup over the Dragon. And it is on Tufts to make the face check. Setting up in the brush. Youngest Light trying to zone. McLeche standing in front. He's looking for that Hecarim, but I don't think they know where Morn is. Here comes on the backside. Well, sorry, it is gonna be taken pretty low, but here comes the onslaught of shadows. So oh, Justin, he's gonna come in as well. They take the down the Victor. It's a 4v5 for now in the fight. They're gonna set up a lot of people, and Belisarius will go down. Justin is ticking pretty low, and so will Morn. John Sue is alive on the backside alongside Easy Life. It's gonna be a 3 for 2. And now the dragon is once again under fire. It's gonna be up to the vein, but he's not gonna get taken down. Gonna have the flash away, but the damage is too much. McLeachy will take down the kill. Easy Life is the only survivor, and he might not be that for long. Gonna land the charm on the McLeachy, but the damage will come through. The boomerangs will go through. Soul picked up for VCU and disaster strikes to the Tufts University Jumbos. The best look that Tufts had had so far, but that's the power of the Olaf this time. Youngest Lay running the vein right on out of the fight. And by the time Jutsu was able to rejoin his team, they were already gone. The front line was gone. And then the carries, they try to step up to the dragon and they get taken down. That is Infernal Soul in the back pocket of BCU. And Tufts, it looked like they were fighting back in this game. But with the soul going over, now the gold lead as well in favor of BCU. Are they on their last legs in the series? 
and you have to wonder, is the strategy working for Tufts? They've gone onto a primary carry both times in these last two engages, but they kind of leave strong. their carries out to dry, you know? They leave Jansu and Easy Life without any sort of protection. That's their primary damage onto the front line. How can they even play a fight Youngest Light and McLeachy if they don't have the protection coming out from their tanks? And a little bit of a different approach might be necessary here as the Baron spawns. Yeah, the front line from VCU is just too strong. They're trying to dive in and buy that space, but the the Ragnarok coming through, the insta ult from the Mordekaiser means that VCU was able to still play together. It just removes so much threat. And with Flash coming back up on Thick Chick, although it is down on a teacher, the Baron just getting one shot, I think this will be uncontested. Yeah, no hesitation as soon as the Baron spawns. VCU runs straight towards that pickup, the Purple Worm, for the second time this game. They're going to have a huge advantage pushing down these lanes to try and end the game. Yeah, absolutely. And they are immediately walking to the mid lane, trying to shove this one up and sending McLeishy up to the top side. Push out, uh, excuse me, bottom side. Push out that lane. Set up a two way push. And room on the side. Sandy Knight available. Easy like Easy like to be careful, but here comes the onslaught of shadows. They gotta try to lock down the OF. This is Lord Drinker will not buy enough time. Three man Magnus Storm coming out from Artemis though. John Sue is still alive. Look at John Sue! With the Silver Bolt. So they're gonna take down the Sivir. It's a three versus two. Make it a 2v2 now. Triple kill for Jansen before he falls. The Thick Chick is still in the middle of the enemy team. Gonna dash in with the lasers. It's gonna be the two solo laners for BCU against the support. It is almost all said and done. The final Q will do it. And we will bid farewell to Tufts in the CSL. It is McVeechee versus the world as Thick Chick goes down. But with the death timer so long, I think you can end the game. Yeah, with the death timer so long, you can end the game. BCU, they get another fight. Jansu trying to get and teach but he's not able to close the gap. And then as soon as he turned on the front line, it was too late. He gets taken down and make Lychee going to take down the base, going to take down the Nexus, going to take down Tufts. Final hit will do it. Five seconds. <laughs> Well, we're getting there. Five seconds on Jansu is not going to be enough time to try and re-engage. Two more autos will do it, and that is it. It's going to be VCU taking the series 2-0 to zero over Tufts. Yeah, VCU, they get it done, but Tufts, they put up a good fight in game number two. They just couldn't quite extend their advantage. VCU, they're just too clean in the team fights, executing on their composition perfectly, not allowing Morn to do anything as Hecarim was so far ahead, but he just... Didn't th th there was an answer for what a Mordecai's so the K QSS came in too late and Jansu not able to get it done unfortunately despite the gorgeous kiting in the mid lane fight. It was so close. I mean, we, we were we were almost ready to go into that decisive game three, but it was the front line of VCU that managed to get the advantage there and allow the carries to continue to push in and take down the jumbos. McLeachy definitely doing his work here on this Mordekaiser against the Shen. It looked a little bit dicey for him at the beginning of the game, but ending at a 6-2 and 10 scoreline and being the sole survivor at the end of the game to take down the Nexus and win the game. And that's going to be it for us here on the broadcast. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for sticking with us here on the League of Legends broadcast with us here on JumboCast. And Ben, thank you so much for stopping by and casting with us as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. What a fantastic stream this was. Yeah, and with that, that's going to be it. And we will see you all in the near future. Don't I think that will be the end of the the jumbos here in the CSL tournament. But yep. But yeah, make sure to stay tuned because JumboCast is still doing a lot of stuff down in the future. We had the League of Legends team here to you know bring us some sanity here without the the presence of these regular sports. But we will be doing our we will be having our return back to those spring sports as they return in April. Be on the lookout on our social media pages for all baseball, softball, lacrosse, you name it, we're covering it. And yeah, that's it for us. And for all of you at home, have a wonderful day.